analysis. Uh, specifically, the Mako header has a series of load commands. Uh, load commands specify how the binary is segmented, uh, what sort of libraries we're linking against at runtime, uh, if there are encrypted sections. Um, some segments in Mako uh, text is typically where executable code or read only constants are located. Uh, data is where writable data is. Uh, and then the link edit table is where we have all of our dynamic linker and symbol data. Uh, if you guys have analyzed uh, PE, a portable executable format, on Windows or other platforms, uh, there's this confusion of section versus segment. Uh, in PE, the top level splitting of a binary is a section. In Mach O, the top level splitting is called a segment, and a segment has many sections. Totally confusing. I don't know why they chose to do it that way, but segment is bigger than section. Uh, one of the problems that you know, we have to deal with when we're analyzing iPhone apps is iPhone apps are encrypted. You know, this is DRM. This is to prevent people from pirating apps. Not that it has stopped people from pirating apps, but that's the intention. Uh, so what, I think to understand how encryption works, let's look at how a typical Mako executable looks. Um, the three LC segments you see, those are the top level segmentation load commands. And on the left side you see the flat file. Um, it's, you know, it's just a string of bits. And so uh, what we're, what we're uh, showing right here is the first step that the Mako loader in the kernel takes to basically map this file into memory. And so basically it takes the segment commands and looks at the file data and the target VM addresses and it just maps them over. Uh, a lot of times you may have a larger VM space than your file space. For example, if you have really large unallocated buffers, it's a, just a really efficient way. So if I'm allocating a you know, megabyte buffer in memory, I don't have to have a megabyte of nulls in my file, for example. And it's important to note that uh, iPhone binaries, the text section is encrypted. So, so what do we do? The second pass that the Mako linker takes uh, is to look at the LC encryption info load command and will actually decrypt uh, a certain portion of the text segment and map it into memory unprotected. Uh, both OS X and the iPhone do this. Uh, if you want the juicy details, uh, all of this is open source. Um, so I, I haven't seen too much research into uh, how this typically works, um, but I, I'd like to see more. I think it's, it's really interesting stuff. Uh, so, given that the text section is encrypted, you know, what, what can we actually see? Um, in our analysis, we're not currently decrypting the text section. Uh, we do have uh, the link edit table. So we get to see all the symbols in the binary. And uh, basically every application uh, I've seen in the iPhone App Store is very gratuitous in the symbols that it actually gives us. Um, also we get to see load commands that, uh, that show what frameworks we're linking with at runtime. So, uh, what, what are we doing to anal analyze iPhone apps? Um, specifically, we're looking at the symbol table, um, which tells us defined, which are implemented symbols. So if a symbol is defined, it's a class that your application has. If a symbol is undefined, it's a, it's a class that your application references. So it may be a framework API. Um, this is true for C functions, as well as Objective-C classes, uh, methods, and uh, instance variables. Uh, and it's also interesting to note that Objective-C is a strict superset of C, so everything compiles down to C, and it plays really nicely. <laughs> Uh, we're, not, we're not doing a VM here, for example. Um, and you know, similar to Android, we, we want to define heuristics to identify features, capabilities, vulnerabilities, for example. Um, and you know, one example of a, an iPhone heuristic is we can look at uh, whether an application uh, imports any address book APIs that allow you to read contact data, for example. Uh, or we can really just run arbitrary queries against the application data set as a whole. And we're actually able to uh, hit every application on a whole data set in about five hours right now on Android and iPhone and run arbitrary queries against it. So that's, you know, that, that's pretty cool. I mean, you imagine in the PC space, if you were to ask, you know, how do I ask a question about every, mo or every PC application written? And that, that's an almost intractable problem. But the fact that we can actually do that in a reasonable amount of time on mobile um, may not stay that way forever, but it it's really helps us right now. Uh, so the constraints on, on what we're analyzing here, I mean, as I've said, we're not analyzing the text section. So that, that limits the amount of uh, automated static analysis we can do without decrypting things. Uh, if people find ways to decrypt, uh, you know, more stuff will happen. Um, and we're also, we're not looking for dynamically loaded code um, because the constants are typically stored in text. Uh, 
and also bypassing frameworks via private APIs. Um, a lot of this stuff won't be able to get into the App Store anyway, so we're, we're not able to analyze that right now. And code downloaded at runtime, of course. And if you exploit libtiff, for example, in your iPhone app and you're downloading code at runtime, you know, we're, we're obviously not going to be able to catch that. So, so kind of to tie it, all, tie it all up in a bow, we downloaded a whole bunch of applications on Android and iPhone, and we built some tools to, to analyze these, this data in mass um, so we don't have to drink Red Bull and do it manually. Um, and so now, you know, what, what sort of questions are we going to ask this data? And what did we find? So uh, I'm going to tell a series of stories. Uh, the first story is, is basically how, when we first got this data set, what did we do? We ask a simple question. Um, are there any apps stealing my contact list? I'm, I'm rather worried about myself and my friends getting spammed. And we came up with, wow, 14% of uh, apps on iPhone and 8% of apps on Android are accessing contacts. That, that's quite a bit. Uh, let, let's pick one. Let's, let's see why one of these apps is doing this. You know, we, we first looked at an Android app, a soundboard app. And we said, well, why is a soundboard accessing my contact lists? Uh, that, that's, that's pretty weird, right? Um, so it requests the right contacts permission on Android, and it references the contacts API. Um, specifically, in this case, it, it, it pulled out the URI for the content provider. Uh, it, you know, we would also found it if it uh, had a string for a content provider, if it referenced any content provider or a contact content provider methods. Uh, so why is this Star Wars uh, soundboard uh, accessing my contacts? You might add. Well. It turns out I didn't have to spend too long, and I found that you can actually set a custom ringtone from one of the uh, Star Wars sounds. You know, I've, I've got a bad feeling about this whenever John calls me. Uh, <laughs> and in, in, in our, in, in the analysis, you know, we, uh, this is an excerpt uh, at the bottom here of um, a tool called Boxmali, which is, which is Icelandic for uh, disassembler. Um, I, I don't know what it is with Android and Icelandic, but it's, it's a great tool. Um, and so we, and we found that the class definitions themselves showed us that um, the purpose was to assign ringtones to contacts, looking at what is actually inside this method. That's the only time we access contacts, and it's perfectly legitimate. And so what, what's the point? Not all apps that access sensitive data are bad. And j uh, just to reiterate that, not all apps that access sensitive data, sensitive data are bad. Not all apps that access sensitive data are bad. So, so we'll talk more about vulnerabilities and additional apps that, that are potentially bad. But I think what's important is understanding what apps can and can't do fundamentally. It's actually a good thing that apps have permissions and can access lots of data. That's what allows us to have really cool apps. So that's important, and we should not be afraid of that. We need to embrace that, as a matter of fact. But what's more important to understand is that we need to, as security professionals, understand what is possible and then look in and actually specifically look at the details and understand what is bad in the very, very small amount of cases and then be able to go on broad scale and look at if that's actually happening in the wild to respond to that. Absolutely. Story number two. So uh, in that crushing defeat of not having found bad things in the wild, uh, we said, okay, well, what else might something steal from me? Um, are there any applications looking at my location? And similarly, we found that, wow, there's a lot of applications looking at my location. 33% uh, on iPhone, 29% of all applications on Android accessing location. Which is crazy when you think about it. A third of all free apps know where you are. So we started going through these apps. Uh, there's a lot of them. Um, and you know, apps that look, that, you know, that access location but didn't seem to need it. You know, these are things that seemingly anomalous, like, like the soundboard. We said, why does the soundboard need to access this? And what we actually found is over and over and over and over again, we found that third-party SDKs were the only piece of code in the application that was accessing the location. And we found that actually interesting. Um, it, it turned out to be third-party advertising SDKs. When you think about it, it, a lot, it makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, an advertising SDK can access your location in order to serve you more targeted ads. Um, it's, it's the Gmail value proposition, right? You know, Gmail looks at your email in order to serve you more targeted ads, and so you don't have to see a giant banner. Um, and people are aware of this. I, I use Gmail personally. It, yeah, I mean, it, as long as everyone knows what's happening, it's, it's, it's a good thing. Yeah, it is a good thing. Uh, so when we look closer, um, one, wireless, or one application in particular, uh, we looked at the, uh, that had the Quattro Wireless SDK. Uh, in the Android simulator, we were actually able to um, pretend we were at 3.1337, um, <laughs> and we Wireshark'd it, as all good reverse engineering uh, things start with. 
Uh, and we found a plain text HTTP request to add.quapi.com, which is uh, Quattro Wireless's ad servers. Uh, and I, I broke down the request just so it's easier to read. And sure enough, we have a poorly rounded version of our lat latitude and longitude being sent in plain text to an ad server. Uh, this is really interesting. So let, let's zoom out a little bit and say, okay, given that an application implements a certain third party SDK, what is its likelihood to access location? And these are the numbers we came up with with some pretty popular uh, third party SDKs. Um, iPhone and Android. I, I think it's, it's really important to take these numbers into context and, and I think the insights on the next page will, will put that into context. Um, so specifically, the, the numbers on Android were generally lower. Um, that is partially an artifact due to how we analyze things. For example, if a developer on Android brings in an ad SDK and that ad SDK wants to access location, but the developer doesn't request the location permission, the ad SDK doesn't get location. Which is a really cool aspect of Android, yeah. by the way. It's, it's pretty focused on keeping the consumer's data private. And, and so our analysis takes that into account. So if an application tries to access location but doesn't have permission to do so, that ap application doesn't access location because it can't. Uh, on iPhone, for example, uh, an application is only allowed to use uh, location if Apple deems it appropriate. Uh, and they actually had a, a kind of a fairly big issue uh, earlier this year and they came out with a statement um, basically saying that they will only approve applications that use location if the application already uses location. So if you download a mapping application or a restaurant locator application, it's okay to have location based ads there. It's not okay to have location based ads in iFart, for example, unless that uses location. Uh, and so when we, we wanted to look at, you know, the prevalence of uh, third party co code as a whole, we actually found um, it was quite prevalent on both iPhone and Android. 23% uh, of applications had one of eight popular SDKs in them, 47% on Android. And, you know, t and I think this is, this is a good thing in the sense that we're actually seeing developers share code and we're actually seeing these SDKs get adoption. Uh, I think it's, it's very important um, and we, we ask, well, what's the point? You know, our, our goal here is that to help people understand what is going on inside of applications. And especially that there's a lot of novice developers who just, hey, I want to develop a mobile application. And I think it's great that the SDKs make it so easy to get a mobile application out in the wild, but we want to make sure that people understand the ramifications of what they're doing. So when a developer brings in third party code, they don't always know what's in it. And in fact, because it's closed source, uh, even very experienced developers don't know what's in it. But uh, depending on the platform, you oftentimes have a lot of control. For example, on Android, a developer gets to choose permissions. Even though they don't get to write the code, they get to choose what permissions their application requests. So an SDK may just say, hey, copy, copy and paste these permissions into your Android manifest. But you don't have to do that. You get to put what you want. And I think that's the power that, that with educated developers, we can make smart decisions for what people do. Um, you know, also, developers need to kind of understand what third party SDKs are gathering, especially when you're creating your privacy policy and things like that, because it's a developer's responsibility to make sure their users are informed and aware of the type of data that their application collects. And you know, if there's any message we have for developers, it's, hey, pay attention to what you're doing and be responsible with what you're doing. Uh, and I think, you know, I, I do want to, you know, put my hat off to uh, how some SDK providers have, have dealt with the situation. Um, uh, they, they make sure developers understand the ramifications of what they're doing. AdMob, for example, this is an excerpt from their SDK. Um, they default location to off in their iPhone SDK and they ask developers to, to carefully consider the privacy issue. And I think, 